Determined attackers easily bypass even the most advanced network defenses. Trying to ramp up staff to detect their back doors can cost thousands of dollars and take months, even years. With Active Countermeasures AI Hunter, we enable junior analysts to detect even the most advanced back doors in a matter of hours. Sign up for a demo and purchase our product today by visiting activecountermeasures.com forward slash BSW. Active Countermeasures, make every analyst a hunter. Innovation's a funny thing, in a cosmic sort of way. While it drives your business forward, it also exposes new risks that can slow you down. As an IT or security professional, every day you need to know, are you vulnerable? Are you compromised? And finally, are you optimized to quickly spot and resolve issues to keep your operation humming? It's your responsibility to help the organization safely and reliably implement the latest connected technologies. So how can you outsmart this little paradox? Rapid7 solutions are powered by advanced analytics and an unmatched understanding of the attacker's mindset. Visit rapid7.com to learn more about how Rapid7 products transform data into action. Hey, we're back. Let me remind you too, we've talked about this a couple of times. We've got a new one out now. It's our on-demand material. You can see some of our previous recorded webcasts and we just, uh, we just got a new one up. Uh, so securityweekly.com slash on demand. And the new webcast is with Logarithm. It's called Getting Started with Threat Hunting, The Basics. Um, Paul, I've already seen some good feedback from this. How did it go? Oh, that was an awesome webcast. Um, we talked about threat hunting, how you can use open source and commercial tools uh, to do threat hunting, the value that some of the open source tools provide, some awesome features within Ro Logarithm's tool that covers a lot of ground when it comes to threat hunting uh, in new and exciting ways. We talked about how UEBA has become a feature, uh, how Logarithm actually had that as a feature long before it was even called UEBA. Uh, and that's you know one of their messaging points today. I saw the demo essentially of how they're uh, pulling all that data together so that you can do successful uh, threat hunting exercises. And it was just awesome. It was just awesome. You should totally check it out. That's fantastic. All right, so in the next segment, we're talking about some of the new things you've learned on the shows. But this is our this is our opportunity to do these article discussions. Um, and I found a couple this week I thought were, were kind of important to take a look at. And we can go through them at whatever pace you're comfortable with, Paul, because there's, there's obviously tons here to talk about. I'm going to bring up this first one. It's been really important to me. Um, we, we did the demo, uh, kind of like the sneak peek of the value prop scorecard. And I've been trying to get it done. Uh, I've had a little bit of a health thing I've been working through for the last couple of weeks, and that slowed me down a little bit, but it's coming together. One of the things I've figured out, though, is that if you're proper in answering the question, what problem are we trying to solve? That, that also helps you set the parameters in terms of what problems are we not trying to solve. So if you keep extending that out, what things should I be focusing on leads you to, so what things should I not be focusing on? And over the course of the last you know, 80 shows or so, we've talked about sometimes it's better to say no to things or, or whatever else. So what's interesting is we're at that point in the year now, Paul, where a lot of people will look at their their uh, their New Year's resolutions, so their goals, and they'll go, ah, I'm blown out. It's all over. What am I going to do? And there was this great article on uh, HBR, Harvard Business Review, that said, before you set new goals, think about what you're going to stop doing. Mm -hmm. We asked this in the Straight Talk framework. I mean, this it's, it's, a, it's not a new concept. What I liked about this, though, was that it said, we, we fall into this, ha this habit, uh, and it's a trap, and most of us fall into it. We start new things before we finish old. Um, you see it in your kids. You see it in, in all sorts of people where, you know, it's kind of like what, what I try to instill at home is if you're going to do a project, understand what you're going to do, pull all the stuff out, right? It's tools or materials or whatever else. Do your project. But then when you're done, it's not done until it's all cleaned up and put away. Then, then it's done. You can move on to the next thing. And we see that when you don't do that, right, it's just chaos and it piles up. Well, we do the same thing at work. We got four, five, six, seven, eight, 10, 12, 30 projects going at a time and five different email threads and two different phone calls and we're on a webinar and we, we've got to learn to do that. So what they basically say is the first thing you need to do is, is you need to take a look at everything. So, so their point there was don't just look at the new stuff and figure out whether you should or shouldn't do it. What you've got to look at is what you're currently doing. In other words, are you doing the right things? And if the answer is no, then you need to course correct. It's not always easy, but you need to do that. So that's why I, you know, I put in a hint here in the show notes, it just it, the structure helps. So this is where like you could use a value prop scorecard or, or the structure of your choosing. We go through lots of questions on this program and just be consistent with how you evaluate those things. And then you need to look at how you assess everything new coming forward, same structure. And then eventually you should get your stuff dialed in. I, I have a little more extreme viewpoint on, on this article, Michael. <laughs> so I've been listening to the Phoenix Project. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure if you ever... And so I actually started reading that a long time ago. I talked to a bunch of people about it. 
And I never went back and like really digested it. And I, I feel bad that I, I hadn't done that. And now the Beyond the Phoenix uh, project is being released. Uh, and so I'm like, all right, I'm going to go back and, and really listen to this book, uh, getting so much more out of it today. And one of the things that if you've read the book, you know what happens is they basically stop all work. So this article talks about like realizing your goals and you might have to stop some things. Sometimes what you need to do is stop everything. And in the book, they do this. They basically stop everything and say, okay, we've got so many things piled up. Like you said, like we started things and they're over here and there's a pile of things over here and a pile of things and projects over here. You know what? We have to stop everything and then reintegrate that back in. Now that begs some challenges because when you start doing things again, you've got a backload of work that's all of a sudden going to come rushing in. And they talk about how to deal with that in yep. the book. But I think sometimes you do just have to kind of stop everything. And again, that's my extreme kind of <laughs> you know angle on this one is stop everything. Uh, and I'm not saying everyone should do that, but it is certainly a, uh, a strategy. They've even, and I've thought about this in our own processes, stopping what you're doing and then just going back to analog, right? And figuring out what your processes are before you then go choose a system uh, to automate that. Now we had a case here in the, uh, in the studio where I think we're a little too early going to analog that we want to use the digital system and understand what works in it and what doesn't before we either choose to step back and go analog to learn more or choose a new digital system. Um, but stopping stuff is, I, I think, a, a strategy that's appropriate at certain, uh, you know, uh, when you reach a, a, a fork in the road, essentially. All right. So, man, you've triggered so many ideas. First of all, uh, I love the idea of, of blowing it all up. Uh, but I'm, I'm an unusual fan of that. Like people who know me well, you know me well. The, you know, like if you look at risk lovers, people are like, yeah, there's risk lovers and then there's you. Like I, I'm never afraid. Like blow it up. Let's figure it out. Mm -hmm. But here's what I would say is if, if you're even pondering that. In fact, here's what I say. If you're terrified of that, if you're listening to us, you go, no, I can never do that. Ask yourself, what's the worst that can happen? Right. And, and, then, and then go past the whole, I'll have a heart attack, I'll get fired, I'll never have friends again, I'll be at, okay, so then say, what's, what's realistic though? Like, if we stopped, if I stopped everything for one week, and I gave the team a break, and we came together, and we reprioritized what would happen, so, so think about it that way. The other thing is, what you just described, so two more points, and then we'll move on. Um, have you seen this thing called the bullet journal? Have you seen that yet? No. Okay. It's considered, it's called the analog answer to the digital life, or something to that effect. Uh, when you and I were far younger, uh, Franklin Planner was the big thing. Franklin Covey Planner. And they still have it, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. And people, uh, it, they're getting people reverting back to it in droves. And the idea is you sit down at the beginning of every day and you have a little book with you and you handwrite in it and you figure some stuff out. Um, Trisha's been using it. We just introduced it to the two older kids. Uh, and now we in our family, we do a morning muster where we get together. We pull out our bullet journals. We talk about it. Um, we're indexing it. And, and what's cool about it is there's a number of ways to be able to use it. And then it can still interface with, you know, so if you're using Trello or whatever mm -hmm. you're doing for email, where all it is, is it's an analog way to do it. And so when you were talking about being able to do analog and digital, I went, oh, there, there are ways to do it. And there's a lot of value to being, go, to, to go back to do that. Third point here, and, and I'll, I'll make an offer and, and let's talk about it. You and I can talk about it in an audience. Um, you know, you can chime in on this as well. I developed out the structure. I developed it out a decade ago. It's called a two week test. I can go to it in more detail later, but um, it's not a, it's it's a structure that we use, and actually Trish and I talked about it last night at length in terms of helping the kids with it. But the idea is you, you can move through a process. So I spent a lot of time, and uh, and even on this program, uh, Dr. Doug and I talked about you know literacy versus fluency. It was actually five steps, right? There's an awareness of something, then you have a familiarity, then you get to that literacy. Literacy is competence; it just means there's knowledge. Fluency is competence applied, and of course, what some people strive for is mastery. A lot of people get confused because they substitute familiarity for competence. But when we look at doing a two-week test and when you're talking about going analog but also experimenting with the digital, what I've kind of created is a structure you can use for 14 to 21 days. So it's, it's called a two-week test, but there's an, ex there's an extension in it if you want. And the idea is just to move you from awareness to fam familiarity. So to your point, I'm not really sure what the digital can or can't do. I'm not exactly sure what we need here. You, it's a structure to try it out for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the two weeks, it doesn't make you an expert. It doesn't mean you've got the mastery. It doesn't mean you're – it means you know enough now to know what you need to know, yes. to know what questions to ask or what else mm -hmm. to do. And you can repeat that cycle a couple of times. If there's enough interest in it, um, we could do it as a segment. It, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not anything I sell. It's something I, I, I do with a lot of my clients, and I've been meaning to kind of doctor it up anyway. And I'm trying to use it with my kids. So I think if it helps people, you know, we'll, we'll slot it into a segment in the future. Um, but um, – I love that. I love that approach. I love that approach of being able to go analog and strip stuff down and keep it simple. Right. And that's kind of the point, right? Like keep like focus on a couple of things and get them done 
Um, I think you'll feel good. Let's talk about second chances then. So this is on uh, the Farnham Street blog. I, I love the work Shane's doing here. In fact, um, he might be fun to see if I can get him on the program. But what he was talking about here is um, second chances and, and learning when things don't go well, basically, was his point. And he, and he gives this fantastic example of bridges. And you know, like, so it basically said, look, if a bridge, if, if you think a bridge is designed that at any given time there'll be 20 cars on it and a car weighs, I'll say, 5,000 pounds – you know, you can de- you can develop out your car, to, your bridge to support 100,000 pounds. He said, but nobody in their right mind would design a bridge to only support 100,000 pounds. You're going to say, but it might actually have, you know, 20 18 wheelers on it, and so now it's going to be two million pounds. Oh, and it could be snow, and there could be ice, and there could be wind, and there could be this and that. And he said, so what happens is, you know, like they, his example was, take the max load that you can envision happening, and then double it, and then develop for that. Mm-hmm. And and that gives us a margin of error. That gives us that margin of safety. Right. And and so what they basically say is you can build it in into your life. And you know, and I got thinking about this to a certain extent because I think this is where ideally we do this well in security. Uh, and I think a lot of times we could do it better in security. And and the idea is so what are the unlikely but possible risks? Right. And and, and I don't mean getting us into the realm of insurance. It's that concept of I've talked about it as risk catnip. Paul, we, we've both seen this. There's stuff that because we're so technically inclined and because we see these things that go wrong, we drive down them like a cat playing with catnip. Like we, oh, this is exciting and it's hitting the dopamine receptors and it's fueling us and the adrenaline's coursing through our system and we feel great. Totally useless, but we feel good because, you know, we could, we could chase down it. So the question is, okay, but what's possible? What's possible that would then be damaging to the business? And that's the second part we got to ask. Of these possible risks, what could harm the business? And then what do we do about it? And all I would offer is, I don't think that, so from a security perspective, it's what we're supposed to do. Where I see this then is this opportunity, and I think this is a good article to introduce this to other parts of your business, is, is that I don't think you have to have the answers if you're in security today. I think you just have to have the questions and say, help me understand what's important to us as a business. Okay, I see a couple of these things can go wrong. And if they did, this would be fairly catastrophic. And, and when everybody agrees, when, when everybody's bought in, then you can say, all right, so what, what should we do about it? What makes sense here? And that's when you can build in your redundancy. Maybe you've got an analog backup. Uh, you know, a lot of police departments, and this is always fascinating to me, when they went to the MDTs, the modal, m- mobile data terminals, and they started putting those in the cars, you, I can remember one, uh, I helped the police department do this, and they, they had a vet. He'd been on the job 19 years. He was getting close to retirement. He bitched the loudest. Paul, that's, oh, I don't want one of those computers in my car. I don't need it. That's crazy. I've been a cop for 19 years. I know how to do it. Put the put the terminal in his car. It goes down for a day. He bitched the loudest. I can't get anything done. Yeah. This is stupid. It's, I got, and it's funny because the chief busted his balls and he was like, dude, you still have a book in your pocket. Like, take it out, write a ticket. Like, did you mm-hmm. forget how that works? Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's I, you know, we've got this opportunity to go talk with people about what works, how it works, and and what their jobs are like, and how to put this type of stuff together. So, anyway, it, it was it was good article. I think Shane does good work, and it's always fun to read. And I I read this one, and I went, ooh, that could be how we're doing it in security. And I think it also represents an opportunity for how we could roll new stuff out in security and get people more involved in it. Uh, I put in a quick one. Uh, the the Norman Nilsson Group here again, they do great work, especially if you're looking at UX. I mean, that's their ex- their their expertise. But they talked about the imper- inverted pyramid, writing for comprehension. It's one of their shortest articles I've ever read. Um, and and the, the basic point is what a lot of people are taught academically, and, and they need to knock it off, is we do all this buildup, this groundswell. It's called you know, burying your jewels. You, you give me all this stuff I don't care about to try to build up to the punchline. And what they're basically saying is if you want people to comprehend this and you want people with short attention spans to come to your website, I'm going to hold out to your email. Put the best stuff up front. Put it up top. But the, But the thing is, Edit it ruthlessly. Like, put it up top and make sure it reads well. Make mm. sure it makes sense. Um, the, the rule of thumb, and I'm, I see it working anecdotally, is you got about five lines in a mobile email. So in those first five lines, don't squander the space. Get right to the point. It's kind I've of, also seen this more, Paul, with presentations. Get right to the point. Yeah. And then, uh, and then if you want more stuff, put it in an appendix. I, I ran into that uh, same problem in my presentation that I just gave Um and as mo- a lot of people know, I've been trying to build in stories that uh, underscore the point of the presentation. Um, I think my story was a little long, but most people, you know, liked the candor uh, that's associated with the story. But, you know, some of the feedback was, well, you know, it took you a little while to get to the point. 
But that was the right. point was to tell a story, relate to the audience. Uh, and then the punchline was basically underscoring uh, points that I would go through uh, in my talk. And I, I think in a presentation, you've got a lot more flexibility to do that. Absolutely. If yeah, I, were building, let's, let's right, if I was building a website, right? Totally different story. If I'm sending an email to someone, totally different story. In my presentation, have some patience. I'm going to get to the point in the story, but I like to tell the story. Now, having gotten the feedback, I, I will... You, I play with how much detail is in that story to make it a compelling story, right? I'll offer you two thoughts because they would be useful for you and anybody else paying attention to it. Um, I, when I went to a, a humor lab uh, years ago, uh, gosh, a decade, decade and a half ago as a new speaker, one of the things that they, that they said, and it really stuck with me, was the longer the joke, the bigger the punchline. The yep. corollary is most people can't deliver a big punchline. So stop with the long jokes. Mm -hmm. Get to the shortest joke possible and be ruthless about it. Since then, as I've done training and, and had experience with stand-up and improv, uh, and I favor improv much more, we used to do an exercise in improv. You'd lay out, like, it's called a game, right? So you play your game. They'd set a timer for three minutes. They go, stop, okay, 90 seconds, go. You've got to do the exact same yes, scene. Yes, yes. So you ruthlessly cut stuff out to you down to the 90 seconds. They go, stop. All right, 45 seconds. Stop, 15 seconds. Now, it's funny because by the time you get to 15 seconds, everybody's in on it. I mean, like, you, like you're just getting down to something where if somebody came in from outside, they'd be like, what are these idiots doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's funny to everybody else. But what you learn in the process, though, is that whatever you thought you needed three minutes for, you could probably do pretty sufficiently in 45 seconds. Yep. And so to your point, yeah, it's, that's exactly the right place to it. And you're also right. If you're in with an audience and you're there and you have that ability or you're doing something visual like we're doing, you can do that. But I, I liked this, and then it also said summaries are helpful, and I've seen that. I think a lot of people they they push the summaries aside. Well, I don't I don't really need a summary. Yeah, no, you do. Like, be blunt, tell them where they can get more information, or give that information where they're likely to go find it, and then summarize it for them. Bullet point format. I like three things they need to take away. And as you know, we talk about here a lot. Next step. Give me the next step. Tell me what it is. Well, now what's uh, interesting? The positive feedback I got was they're like. I, they did like the story, but they appreciated that I ended exactly on time. And I told Isn't them, like, great? I don't know how long, uh, you know, this this presentation is going to take. First time I've given it, didn't have much time in my schedule to really, you know, practice it. I'm like, so I'm going to deliver it, and I'm going to deliver it on time, and hopefully I get to, and I focused on the right things. They were appreciative that the in all of the time I was speaking, there was content. It was useful content to them, and I ended on time. There were complaints about, and we've heard complaints in the past about presenters that either go under or over time. Uh, and I've learned over the years, and this is important for your business uh, meetings as well in Business Security Weekly, right? Is being on time is the best possible outcome, and coming under or over is usually going to be a negative in either direction. And the ending on time is is the place to be. Um, yep. I, I was just I, sometimes I, I feel right like now. I was kind of lucky that I I ended on time. But no, I don't think that though, Paul. I, I mean, I, it's yeah. nice of you to say that. I think that you've got enough experience now, thinking through thoughts and prep, and you understand how to work a clock. I know that one of the things we've worked on this program is the same thing. Like we, yeah. we look at the clock, we're paying attention to the segments, and and that to me that shows respect for the audience. Right, and, and that's fantastic. Um, Two more pieces here then. Just try to be respectful to our audience. and Because sure. uh, we went a little, little long in that first segment, but Dan was so compelling. Mm. Uh, how could we not? Uh, Tomas is back. Uh, the clearest articulation of a marketing roadmap. This this maps to everything you and I talk about, so I had to throw it in there. You know, Tell people that, that compelling story and move them to that future state. Right. So here's where you are. Here's where you want to be. And, and get people to go, yeah. Then you can build in that benefit. And what he pointed out here very specifically was build in that personal part to it. You got to make it real for them. It's not just, and the project will be a success. It's, and things are going to go really well and people are going to thank you for it. That's going to lead to the promotion that you're gunning for. That promotion is going to come with that pay raise you want, which means you're going to put that pool in the backyard just like they had in Christmas vacation. So it's yeah. fantastic. <laughs> um, and, then, and then, you know, and then he said, and this is the part where I see a lot of people get kind of, it gets kind of stuck with it. But then he said, all right, so go figure out who you're selling to. Now, this is different. And I like the way he split it here. It's not about, uh, well, I could be selling to this person or this person. He's saying, look, most of these large organizations are making matrix decisions. So go figure out who's involved in the decision-making process and go understand what, they, what each of them needs. Then go map your story to their particular needs. That's where I see most people, by the way, struggle with this. That's because that's that's simple not easy. It's simple to say, or it's easy, not simple. Whatever the way to do it, it, it's it's a fairly straightforward thing to explain. It's a little bit more complicated. And he said, use multiple channels. And I think this would go to what Dan was just talking with us sure. about. People are going to come at you from different ways. 
get them covered where they're going to be looking for you and how it works. I like it. All right, this last one I liked. Um, three ways to tell a stranger about your strengths and experience. I, I don't know about you. I, I kind of get tired uh, of this whole like um, uh, banal small talk. I don't. I don't really care. Especially like like if I'm New England, somebody wants to talk about the Patriots. Oh my God, would you stop? <laughs> Just kidding, Paul. Yeah. Um, but uh, what I find a lot of times is like if we say to somebody like, "What do you do?" You know, it sounds more like a laundry listing um, than not. And so what it basically said is, look, if you want to talk to somebody. And, and you want to answer that question and you want to be a little different. So whether you're looking for a new gig, you're at one of these conferences uh, or whatever else, instead of being like, well, I went here or I worked here or I've done this, you, they give you three things you can do. First thing you can do is you can describe a stretch assignment. Um, this one's interesting to me. Like I love it as a concept. I feel like this is much better in an interview situation or when someone's asked you a very pointed question about like, you know, so tell me about, and it's kind of like that. So tell me about a time that you've been successful, but you know, tell somebody like a time, like when you've gone out and taken a risk, tell that story. Um, but the ones I like better are the next two offer a personal story that shares your why. Don't just tell me you're in security. Why are you in security? And I, I personally hope it's not the paycheck, but what you do it. I mean, if you've been doing it long enough that you just like me, I, I ask too many questions. I'm fascinated by this stuff, fascinated by human nature. I ask questions and uh, I'm a security person. I think that kind of stuff is fascinating. Um, and or talk about your process, not your goal. And I love this because I, I'm look, I, I love systems and I love process and, and, and I don't like crappy process that gets as bad results. But I don't really care what your outcome is. I want to know how you're going to get there. What, what are you doing? What are you investing in? How, how are you making that work? What, is, what does the process look like? And quite frankly, if you meet with me and you want to talk about those things, I'm in all day. I, I don't need to talk about me. I'd rather talk about you. Uh, let's talk about your why. Let's, what, what drives you? What fires you up? What, what have you invested in? How does it work? And I think if you start doing those things, you're memorable and you don't come off like an arrogant prick. One thing that I've done uh, in the past couple of shows that subconsciously I didn't I didn't understand the value it was just something that kind of came out in my interactions with people at the shows is I I'm a different uh persona that may be coming up to the booth than a lot of the other people coming up to the booth so if the booth is large enough where they have seats like I would just go sit down and make myself comfortable and people were really kind of taken back by that and I, I kind of realized that that was a strategy that I was employing uh, to kind of break down some barriers and uh, and be comfortable and and show interest. Now the people working the booth are sometimes taken back by that, but you know I think it's a good thing. It's show me that like no I'm I am actually interested in what you're talking about. Whereas I think the majority of the people don't want to be sold on something and are very hesitant going to the booth. I just walk up and go sit down, make a comment about their chairs or their their swag, and be like I want to hear about what you do. Uh, and they were like, oh my God, like taken back by that. But yep. I think it's kind of interesting icebreaker for me. <laughs> when, when well, it goes to back the... to your point that you made last week too. I mean, you can dive right in. Well, what problem do you solve? What value to create, right? You can use the scorecard, but man, if, if you're going to hit people hard nose on that, most of them do not know how to answer that question. Nope. You go up, you show them that you're a human, you can sit down, you're going to disarm them. You're going to break the ice a little bit. They're not exactly sure what's up. And you're like, look, I'm, I'm interested. I'm here. I'm sitting. This is comfy. What do yep. you got? Take me through it. Right. And, and and when they start to fumble, you're not like, all right, pfft, I'm out of here. You're like, yeah, that's not really what I asked, though, right? What I right. And, and what I love is, and I always enjoy it when you and I get to do this together, is we just kind of feed off each other. We play. Mm -hmm. We feed them what we think the answer is. Yes. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, okay, well, so you agreed with me. But I, I already got likes on Facebook today. I put up a CAC picture, so I don't need them from you. So is that what you do, or do you do something different? Mm -hmm. And once you give them a story, they'll do a story. You're good. You can have those types of conversations. So I like it. I think these are good ideas. It's a lot of fun. All right, so let's take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll talk about innovation as a company secretly, not secretly. They're prepping for an IPO. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. And it's a good time to go to check us out at facebook.com slash security weekly. Give us those likes. It'll keep you up to date with the things we're working on, not just the live broadcast, but everything we got going on. There's so much to do and see. Find your peers, have great conversations, like each other. It all feels good. We'll come back and we'll show you the trends happening in the world of security innovation.